This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. The Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. All Hit Radio Welcome to the X-Zone A place where fact is fiction And fiction is reality Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell And welcome to the X-Zone, everyone. I am Rob McConnell, and for the next four hours, I am your host, I am your guide, as together we cross the time-space continuum to this place that I call the X-Zone. It's a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. It's a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. And the X-Zone comes to you Monday through Friday from 10 p.m. Eastern until 2 a.m. Eastern, right here on the X-Zone Broadcast Network and our growing family of broadcast affiliates around the world, and on our satellite programming providers. If you'd like to send an email, studio at exxonradiotv.com, on all social media sites, exxonradiotv, and our website, www.exxonradiotv.com. We're going to be talking today about the psychology of terrorism, and Dr. Ann Speckard is with us. She's the director of the International Center for Study of Violent Extremism at George University Adjunct uh, associate professor of psychiatry and world-renowned expert on the psychology of terrorism. She's interviewed nearly 500 terrorists and also survivors of terror attacks and uh, hostage takings. She is currently interviewing ISIS defectors and developing a counterterrorism program to fight ISIS in the social media space. She has uh, the insight to break down the inner workings of a terror operation and the psychology behind it. Uh, first of all, Dr. Speckhardt, always great talk to you. Thank you very much for joining us today. And um, in your opinion, why is terrorism still happening around the world? Well, Rob, um, terrorism is about politics, and it's about people that give up on the political process and decide that attacking innocent civilians is the way to go. They think that using violence will uh, change the political process, and they'll get what they want. But haven't they seen by now it really doesn't work? No, because um, in short run, uh, sometimes it does work. I mean, it, it, I don't think that there's any, but ever been any you know, great victory for terrorists, mm-hmm. but there have been short run gains. Um, they can disrupt the political process in Madrid when they um, bombed the train station there. I think they bombed two trains. Mm-hmm. Uh, the election results were totally changed. And... Um, you know, those kind of things can happen all the time. And they can they can force concessions from the government that they're trying to deal with. Um, they can force people out of office. How is terrorism born? Uh, from uh, uh, the political process failing and, and from people having access to um, the ability to create violent solutions and then developing an ideology that promotes using terrorism as a solution. And always these ideologies are wrong, but they argue that for this cause, we can use violence. Maybe we're defending our faith, we're Mm -hmm. defending innocent unborn babies, we're defending our land, our women are being raped. So this time, 
and for this cause, we can uh, suddenly attack innocent civilians. In your opinion, Doctor, the Black Lives Matter movement, are they a terrorist group? Not as far as I can see. Um, Aren't they I mean, doing I, the same? I don't see an ideology coming out of them that says to use violence. I mean, to tell you the truth, that's not a movement that I'm really on top of. Okay. But no, I think it's angry people that are angry about police violence. Well, what, what's the difference then between people who are angry against police violence and terrorism then? Well, again, you're asking me about something I haven't studied, but okay. as far as I see it, the Black Lives Matter movement brings people out to the street, mm -hmm. uh, tries to uh, engage in nonviolent ways, and is really, really angry about a lot of black people being uh, uh, stopped and frisked and killed uh, by various police departments around the country. And uh, if they start saying things like that we should kill the police, mm -hmm. then that's a, a different story. Then, then we're talking about a movement that's endorsing violent solutions to a political problem. And there is a real political problem, sadly. So uh, uh, a non-terroristic movement, as we're portraying Black Lives Matter to be right now, can in fact morph into a terrorism group if their methods and means of operation escalate. That's actually something that I've been concerned about because yeah. um, we've seen ISIS um, try to infiltrate. When Freddie Gray was killed in Baltimore, ISIS was tweeting, uh, black men of Baltimore, we're with you. Mm -hmm. And um, ISIS makes a real point of saying, we don't care about skin color. We don't care about ethnicity. We speak multiple languages. The important thing is we're united by God. Right. And Doctor, we've got to take our break here. Please stand by. Exo Nation, Dr. Ann Speckard is our special guest this hour. And the good doctor and I return on the other side of the short break here in the X-Zone from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. This is Kevin Randall. For nearly 30 years, I have been investigating the case of the Roswell UFO. I have interviewed hundreds of people and stood on the crash site. Now in Roswell in the 21st century, I have reviewed dozens of hours of audio and videotaped interviews, examined hundreds of files that relate to the crash, and have returned to Roswell in an attempt to put all that information into the proper perspective. For the first time in Roswell in the 21st century, I have made a dispassionate reevaluation of all that material and provide a new look at what happened. This is a book that clears away all the clutter that has hidden the truth for so long, strips away the various lies that surround the case, exposes the Air Force attempts at cover-up, and found a core of solid information that tells us all where the case stands today. Roswell in the 21st century will be available in just a few weeks. For more information, please visit my website at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. Gibbs A. Williams, PhD, is a practicing psychoanalyst, supervisor, researcher, and author in New York City. Much of his life has been dedicated to understanding nature and the uses of meaningful coincidences or synchronicities. His radical and original non-Jungian, non-mystical, non-magical theory of synchronicities illuminates much of the fog surrounding this challenging and perplexing topic. His ideas and manners are fresh, presented in a style that is both entertaining and highly informative. He is also an expert on crisis intervention specially focused on violence reduction for the police and citizens, mastering anxiety, frustration and stress without the use of medication, and effectively preventing and treating heroin addiction. Dr. Williams can be contacted at his email address at gwwilliamsny11 at aol.com or visit his website at www.drgibbswilliams.com. Shamanism is recognized as a method to access the quantum level. Mastery of shamanic skills puts spiritual information and healing power into your hands. Path Home Shamanic Art School, a bonded Colorado certified occupational school, has met rigorous state standards ensuring its director and instructors have the qualifications to teach the shamanic arts. Path Home offers a certification program in blocks of study. Block 1, a five-day intensive, will be held in the beautiful mountain town of Coldale, Colorado, October 13th through 18th. Registration deadline is September 12th. 
Experience Journey Trance, Power Animals, Helping Spirits, Sacred Space, and Life Purpose. Come discover your power. Join me, Gwilda Wiyaka, in the magical world of shamanism. Call 303-775-3431 or visit findyourpathhome.com. Welcome back, everyone. Dr. Ryan Speckhardt is our special guest this hour. We're talking about terrorism. And um, first of all, doctor, thanks very much uh, so much for reaching out to us all the way from Greece. And um, when it comes to terrorism worldwide, based on the psychology and the people that you've interviewed, are the tactics the nations are using to try and fight ISIS, in your opinion, the best methods to be used? Could you repeat that, please? Certainly. Based on the people that you have interviewed who were terrorists uh, and based on your expertise in psychology, are the nations of the world who are trying to defeat ISIS using the right tactics and techniques? Okay, Rob. This is a tricky question because anything you do is going to have a trade-off. Sure. So there's never a completely right answer. I mean, the, the, the right answer is, you know, sort of the beauty pageant answer, of bring uh, peace and uh, goodness around the world. And if you can do that, that's what you should do. But in the absence of that, um, right now we're seeing uh, drone kills and bombings and trying to kill terrorist leaders. And when you knock out the leadership, that does uh, decapitate the group. But if they can easily replace their leaders and if the expertise like bomb making expertise is widely diffused throughout the group, um, then that's not something that works real well. And the trade off is terrorists almost always embed themselves in civilian communities. So if you kill a terrorist leader, you usually kill the people around him. Um, and then they can make videos and photos of killed little kids and, uh, females that are killed. And, uh, they can recruit more people to their movement and create anger over what we're doing to try to stop the terrorist movement. So the answer is yes and no. Um, we're certainly winning back a lot of the territory when we're fighting ISIS right now. Um, we've hit a lot of the leadership and taken them out. That's good. Um, it'll remain to be seen whether they can, um, still operate in a smaller territory if leaders will rise up to, uh, take the place of, of those we've killed, and if they'll have the same level of expertise, I, I'm a little worried that they will. And um, and also, when we talked to ISIS defectors, they told us if we lose our territory, it's not a problem. We shave our beards and we blend into normal society. And if you watch what's going on in Turkey right now, all they have to do is get back over into Turkey, and they can blend in in Turkey. And ISIS is really tolerated in Turkey right now. What about the terroristic uh, possibilities here in the homeland, in Canada and the United States? Let's talk about the United States because that's where we, the bulk of our listeners are. Should the doors to such massive numbers of immigrants be opened, especially since the, the vetting process cannot be accomplished in the same way and manners as it can be from other nations who actually have databases and who have the information that the vetting officers can actually verify. Well, Rob, there again, you're um, dealing with trade-offs. And we have to decide. Um, we are a signatory to the UN. Mm -hmm. um, we do believe in taking refugees in. And if we want to change our stance on that, we can. Um, there are issues with refugees, particularly if you take them from a war-torn area where groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS have um, been good at recruiting, because you may end up getting someone that's been recruited to the group. It's usually not the case. There have been um, uh, a couple of cases now in Europe where uh, ISIS cadres have represented themselves as Syrian refugees. They even had fake passports. Mm -hmm. But my view is, if you're trying to get into the U.S., why would you go to all that work? Why would you um, risk getting caught as you go through the refugee vetting process? If I was ISIS, if I was in the leadership, I would just use somebody that hasn't, um, that oh, we call them clean skins, that they they haven't uh, been noticed by law enforcement, but you've got them solidly on board, 
and that has a European passport. And I would put, you know, 10 of them on planes with instructions, go to this city, buy guns and uh, do a Nairobi style attack. And uh, it's very simple. So, you know, using the visa waiver system would be much more um, useful and likely to end with a result that a terrorist group wants than waiting for two years and going through the vetting process and on and on. And we have to say we've had tons of refugees come that have made great contributions to our society. And, um, and you know, just looking at these Syrians running away from ISIS and running away from Assad, I mean, pregnant women are getting on boats. Uh, they don't know how to swim. They're going across on overloaded boats in high seas, even in winter. There was a woman that landed in Lesbos, Greece, that gave birth the minute the um, uh, landed on the beach. And, you know, that's someone I want to open my arms to. I, I'm not afraid of her. I, I feel fear with her for what she's running from. But it would seem that the, the vast majority of Americans are against the Syrian refugees. And it's one of the hottest topics uh, in the presidential candidates that we see on television and the media. It's nice to be part of the United Nations, but the United Nations doesn't take uh, any of the any of the uh, consequences for the economic disruption that these these immigrants are causing on all the nations that are taking them. Do you think the United Nations is just going a little bit way too far? No, the United Nations is all of our countries together, and we made our policies as mm-hmm. countries together of what's the right and just way to handle refugees. And uh, if we want to change those policies, we certainly can. But the question is, um, how much do you let fear rule you? And right now we have Donald Trump doing a lot of fear mongering. But um, but he's just expressing the voice of the people. That's what the American public are saying. We don't want refugees. We want our borders closed. The refugees are ruining our country. If that's the voice of the people then he's doing the right thing. The voice of the people gets shaped by what their politicians tell them, what their news tells them. And if their news is constantly mm-hmm. telling them to be afraid, yeah, then they'll say, uh, close our borders. Well, but we, if we've seen what... It, I'm tra- if they look at it realistically, mm-hmm. they'll see that uh, refugees are the backbone of this nation. This is, I mean, we're an immigrant country. And every wave of immigrants we've ever had into this country mm-hmm. um, has had dissenters that said those people will ruin our country. I mean, I'm Irish, and, uh, you know, it used to be Irish not welcome. Yeah, well, you see, except there's one big problem that I see. We don't have the immigrants from Ireland, Scotland, Italy, and the rest of the the countries that enriched both Canada and the United States by coming over, trying to force Sharia law on us, and making us comply to their way of life, making us... Bec- uh, making us take them and what they believe in and forcing us out. I believe we're too politically correct. And when I see people like Donald Trump standing up to the, the status quo, you know, he's got to say, well, geez, all these people are behind him. And, you know, I don't want Sharia law. If they don't like it, go back home. You know, like, why, why are, should they be able to force their beliefs on us. Like, you can't even say Merry Christmas anymore. It's not the Christmas holidays. It has to be the winter break. It's not Easter anymore. It has to be the spring break. Don't you think that when you look at the big picture without even contemplating what politicians are saying and what the media is saying, but when you look at the day-to-day life, that it's gone too far? Well, Rob, um, the examples that you just gave of you shouldn't wish Merry Christmas anymore, if, if that's true in a public school, it's true because, at least in my country, uh, we separate religion and state. So um, if we can't say Merry Christmas, we also can't say um, uh, Ramadan Mubarak because church and state are separated. And in my view, that's a good thing. I, I'm totally supportive of that. And uh, I don't see anybody forcing Sharia on anyone in the U.S. I mm-hmm. certainly see it happening in Syria and Iraq. And if people want to run away from that, I don't blame them in the least, and I'd be happy to help them. You would. But, um, of course. Why? I, I feel sorry for any woman that's uh, forced to wear a niqab and a burqa against her will. I feel sorry for women that are forced to marry. 
mm-hmm. uh, are forced to stay in their home and can't leave their home without a, a male chaperone. But I don't fear that happening in the U.S. at all. We've got good laws and we've got a good political process. But and we, uh, but that... no one forces their religion on other people in uh, modern democracies. That's not happening. I disagree with you there, Doctor. I wholeheartedly disagree with you. Well, if you can give me good examples of where that's happening and laws that support that, but um, look what I live in Washington, look, look. D.C., and I don't see any laws that support uh, forcing other people to take on your religion and dress like them. Well, look in what's fact, happening, the, look what's happening the, throughout the, Europe. Look what's, hap- look what's happening throughout Europe where the refugees have been given the opportunity I mean, to... I mean, the burkini ban? I mean, France passed a law just the opposite, mm-hmm. that oh, oh, oh. you can't wear... You cannot wear a burkini on the beach. So it's just the opposite of what you're saying. That, no, no, ma'am, it's that, not. No, I'm sorry. Look at the pictures and the reports that we see out of Paris. Look at the, look at the terrorist attack in Paris. Look what's happening to London. You know, I'm sorry. It seems that they want to escape the tyranny. They want to escape the war, and yet they want to... They want to carry on in the way that they ran away from in the new countries that they come to. Well, first of all, the Paris and Belgium attacks were taken, uh, for the most part, by people that had grown up in Belgium and France, and they hated their own countries. And there's a reason for that. They were North Africans that uh, were second generation, so born in country. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the countries in Europe don't have the same social systems that we have in the United States and I think in Canada. If you come as an immigrant, it doesn't matter what religion you are, it doesn't matter what color you are, you have a good chance of succeeding. And uh, if your dad came as a coal miner, Mm -hmm. uh, the society doesn't expect you to be a coal miner and your grandchildren to be a coal miner. Um, you You can get educated and you can move up and that's what a melting pot society is about and we should be very, very proud of that. So we don't have the same issues as they have in Belgium and France. Um, and I can tell you, I made hundreds of interviews in Belgium mm-hmm. with people that were born in country, but were from North Africa by descent. So they were Muslim, North African, Belgians. And they would tell me things like, uh, they couldn't get jobs. I, I would watch. If they went to the nightclub, the bouncer would tell them, go, go home Moroccan. That is not going to happen in the U.S. I mean, I know we have some race issues. We acknowledge that at the top of this program. Sure. But, but we do not have... Um, issues with Muslims. We don't. Where we would tell somebody, based on your religion, you can't get in this nightclub. Or based on uh, your ethnic heritage, you can't get in this nightclub. You know, go home Moroccan. That doesn't happen. Um, We have really good uh, laws with really good teeth in them about rental and, and buying homes. People that live in Mullenbach, Brussels, tell me they can't move out of Mullenbach even if they want to. Because nobody will rent to them. I had a PhD uh, Algerian, Mm -hmm. a very nice woman, very cultured, helping me in Paris when I went into the Banlous to make interviews. And she told me, Anna, I can't rent an apartment. Everywhere I show up, they're like, oh, you're Algerian? Forget it. I mean, they would say it right to her face. And um, the Europeans have laws against discrimination, but they don't have good um, remedies. So anybody that goes to through a very bureaucratic process to fight that they've been discriminated against um, will win basically nothing. All right, stand by, Doctor. We've got to take a break. We'll be right back. Exonation. Nation. Dr. Ann Speckard is our special guest. And here's a couple of websites, www.annspeckard.com and www.icsve.org. I'm Rob McConnell. This is the Exxon. Don't go away. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the Exome Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, High Tech with Corey Kay, and every minute of the 24-7, 365 programming of the Exome Broadcast Network by calling 712-432-9459, courtesy of TalkStream Live. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. 
Call 712-432-9459 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember, 712-432-9459 for the best of paranormal, new age, thought-provoking, sci-fi radio programming 24-7, 365. Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? Well then, meet Dr. Kimberly McGeorge and her cutting-edge breakthrough knowledge that combines science with possibility. Dr. Kimberly brings real-life answers and healing to those open to alternative solutions. She teaches solution-based programs and classes that will change all areas of your life forever. Specializing in conscious creation, intuitive readings, and energy medicine, you can rapidly shift health, relationships, business, and money and abundance challenges quickly. Receive her best-selling book, Secret to Everything, at no cost by going to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone. That's right. Transformation can start now. Just go to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone and receive Dr. Kimberly's book for free. While science pursues fact, magic accesses the quantum level, bridging random facts to form truth. As long as science and magic remain separate and polarized, the truth cannot be known. I'm Gwilda Wiecka. Join me on the Science of Magic radio program, dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. During each episode, I'll be speaking with experienced and respected scientists and mystics. From astrologers to astronomers, from medical doctors to shaman, the scientific method to dowsing and intuition will weave together information from seemingly divergent practices to promote unity and enlightenment. Join me, Gwilda Wiyaka, and the Science of Magic right here on the Mutual Broadcast Network. For more information, visit www.thescienceofmagic.net. I am Dr. Carl O'Helvey, founder, president of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence-based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. So Nation, Dr. Ann Speckard is our special special guest, www.annspeckard.com and www.icsve.org. You know, Doctor, uh, I, I agree that there may be a little bit too much hype in the news. I believe that there might be a little bit too much hype with certain politicians. But when we look back and we remember the Boston Marathon bombing, we remember San Bernardino, we remember 9-11, we remember the first attack on the World Trade Center, we look at all the terroristic acts that are going on in other parts of the world, when we realize that the fight against Islam is nothing new, we go back to the Crusades, nothing has changed. There has to be a better reason than what we're being told. There has to be something a lot deeper. And I, th- and I think taking in separating the church and state really didn't accomplish anything. So what, what, what do we do? What are, these, what are these people that you're interviewing that, that paint a totally different picture from the one that most of us ever see? Where is the problem? 
it's political, Rob. I mean, if you live in an area, mm-hmm. I mean, I just got back in June from interviewing in the Balkans. And if you live in an area where there's really high unemployment and there was war, and you remember that people came to your aid during the war and stopped the rapes and stopped things, that was uh, us, thank you very much, NATO and America. And you remember that, and then you see what's going on in Syria, and you see Assad uh, treating his population horribly. Um, a lot of people from Kosovo uh, went to hell. When they got there, they were like, wait a second, I'm not sure about these groups, I'm not sure about this version of Islam. Some of them loved it. They were like, hey, this looks good to me. I like the idea of a caliphate. But keep in mind, when they're being sold the caliphate, the ones that liked it, the others went home, but the ones that liked the caliphate, they're being told, this is a wealthy oil nation, and we're going to share the wealth. Um, You're going to have an important position. Um, We're going to live by our religion. And, you know, of course, eventually they see that this is all a pack of lies. But if you come from high unemployment, no hope, no nothing, and you remember war and you feel strongly about justice, you might go and help. And, you know, eventually you're going to wake up and say, this is a really dark movement and dark group that's doing terrible things. But, you know, the allure... You have to understand it in the context in which it occurs. If it occurs with a very unhappy life, with a feeling that I can't live my religion, or I can't, um, I can't get a job, I, I can't uh, make it in my life, then you know you start to understand it differently. Okay, so you've got all these, but but. Let's go back to what I said. This is nothing new, the fight between Christianity and other religions against Islam. It's thousands of years old. It's nothing new. It has nothing to do with the separation of religion and state. How do we explain why it happened? What is the psychology of this continuous war? Well, first of all, I'd say when you go back far enough in history, you find Muslims, Christians, and Jews living peacefully together. um, And you find a lot of interpretations of Islam to say you have to respect people of the book. And, okay, if they live in our territory, they've got to pay a a tax because they're not contributing in other ways um, to the zakat. That's the charity. But um, always you see political leaders drumming people up with religion. So we saw that in the Balkans, for instance. And we we see people drumming up with ethnicity. I mean, when you talk about the Black Lives Matter uh, movement, uh, if you're going to try to get people uh, worked up, you're going to do a them and us, you know, those black people and the white people or the other way around. And it works. If you separate people and try to play upon their identity and say your identity, your religion is being insulted, you need to do something about it, it works. And that's all politics. It's also psychology that, you know, the things that we hold sacred and dear are important to us. So imagine, I mean, I know you're in Canada, but, you know, there's plenty of veterans. If they saw you trampling on a U.S. flag, they'd get really angry and they might even get violent because for them that U.S. flag is sacred. And, you know, for a lot of people, their religion is sacred. So if a politician tells them, this country, this other group of people is insulting our religion, they can get people worked up. So what are we supposed to do? Well, how is society supposed to react? Where does the fear originate from? I I really can't believe it is all political and media-driven. No, of course not. I mean, there's, there's real things. I mean, ISIS is real, and they're beheading and raping and doing horrible things. Um, but you know, the underlying issues are political, the Shia Sunni divide that, uh, Zarqawi, one of the first, uh, uh, terrorists in Iraq and, you know, their whole group moved to Syria, uh, exploited that. He wanted as much killing as possible between the Shia and Sunni because he knew that it would make his group strong for exactly what we just got done talking about, that if you, if you create an other and an enemy and, they start killing each other, then eventually you're going to get your people to group together and really angry and really upset about the other group. But what do we do? Um, As much as possible, we create security so that um, uh, people don't divide along those lines. And, uh, 
uh, see any benefit to themselves of believing those kind of lies. Mm -hmm. Because eventually, if you do get people to divide and they fight each other, there's truth in the lies. They become true. I mean, we saw that in Iraq when um, Zarqawi was um, doing marketplace bombings of Shia and doing horrible things to the Shia. They retaliated and they started murdering Sunni people in the most despicable ways. I have a friend that worked in the morgue and she still has nightmares of it. And, um, you know, after a while, then it becomes true. You can't trust your neighbor who is the other. Mm -hmm. And um, so you have to work to restore that. And that's very difficult. It's much better to do prevention. And that's why we need to be really careful in our countries that we don't um, whip up rhetoric against Muslims, that instead we see, for the most part, most of us are moderates, um, whether we're Christian, Jewish, or Muslim. Of course, there's extremists in all three of those groups. And um, the extremists we should speak against, but we should be very aware that we want to stay united. And to be honest with you, if I was a Muslim parent raising a teenager right now, I'd be really scared. And I would want all the support I could possibly get around that teenager because teenagers are by definition experimenting and uh, separating from their parents and, uh, let's face it, a bit stupid. And uh, everything coming at them over the Internet from groups like ISIS is trying to seduce them and say, you don't like the existing world order? I've got a new one for you. So... Freedom of speech is good in one aspect, but it is deadly in another, right? And there's your trade -offs. For me, I'll take freedom of speech no matter what. And uh, I, I, I like living with freedom of speech, but you know, some people would say we should limit it. Mm -hmm. But you know, since I was a little girl, there were uh, you know uh, parades where Nazis were free to parade themselves on the street. Yeah. I think they're despicable. Yeah. But I still would rather live in a country that has free speech and take the risks that go with that. All right. And Let me ask you this about free speech. The separation of religion and, and state, church and state. Should it be the, the free speech right of any Christian who wants to say the Lord's Prayer in school? Shouldn't they be guaranteed that right? And yet that right has been taken away from them because of the Muslims who disagree with it, that it infringes on their rights. Where's the trade-off there, doctor? I think if you go back to those cases, they were mostly brought by atheists and uh, possibly some of them by Jewish people, but I don't. I think that argument was started way before we had um, uh, too much Muslim immigration, and I don't think that it was Muslims that were uh, bringing those cases. But yeah. And yet they, when, you look in, when you look into the recent case in, in the state of Maryland, it was the Muslims who brought the case to the school board that they were saying Christmas and Easter. Well, you know, we, uh, we have those cases all the time, and then it's, you know, going to the extreme that you're limited and you can't uh, speak about religion in public places. Mm -hmm. And um, again, it's trade-offs. Would you rather have the two things separated and not have anybody else impose their religion? You know... I mean, I remember when my husband was serving in Iraq, mm -hmm. he said soldiers very often were led in Christian prayers. And I thought if I was a Jew or a Muslim, I, I would resent that, that my leader was praying a Christian prayer over us before we went into battle. So are you, saying, I, are, you saying that, would, are you saying that any reference to God should be taken away? For example, in God we trust? Should that be changed because it might offend the Muslims? That wouldn't be the reason for changing it. The reason for changing it would be to separate church and state, which is in our Constitution. I'm not a constitutional lawyer, so I don't know how far you should go. And I would prefer that it just stayed rather moderate um, for my own preferences. So but we, I'm a psychologist, not a lawyer, so, so that you really should pose those questions to lawyers. So we don't but, shake the boat, right? I'm sorry, what? We don't shake the boat. We don't stir the pot. Oh, no, I would definitely stir the pot. I have no problems with stirring the pot, but I don't believe that it's to um, please Muslims that we now are not allowed to have Christmas trees, Christmas pageants, uh, to say prayers before school starts. Those, those cases in the U.S. are really old. Yeah, they go back to the 1960s and 70s, mm -hmm. and I believe they were brought by groups like the ACLU, um, and they were brought in behalf of parents that were either atheists or non-Christian but not Muslims who uh, resented that 
taxpayer dollars were being used to pray prayers that they didn't agree with. And they have a point. I mm-hmm. mean, I, I would prefer, for me, I would prefer that we just kind of all get along. And I think those people do take it a bit far. But, you know, obviously they're within their rights within the Constitution or else they wouldn't win their legal cases. Isn't it funny? You know, why I, I had a I had a an expert on the show a couple of weeks ago, and he said it's, what is happening in the United States and other countries in the world is you're taking a male beta fish and throwing it in with a bunch of females. There are certain fish that don't mix. There are certain people that don't mix. Oh, my God, you could say that. You know, do you remember when we had John F. Kennedy running for president? Everybody was so afraid that he was a Catholic and he mm-hmm. was going to be following the problem. We've heard the same thing about Jews, and to me, it's just disgusting. Why but we've never had it. we've never had Catholics blow us up. We've never had Catholics. Sure, sure, we have. We've had abortion clinic bombings. Oh, well, hold, hold, hold on, hold on here, hold on here, hold on here. You're mixing yeah. you're mixing apples and bananas. I'm talking about terrorist attacks. We haven't had Catholics who have committed terrorist attacks in the homeland. We haven't yes, had. We have. Yes, we have abortion clinic. That's not a uh, terrorist uh, attack. Well, it certainly is uh, by U.S. government definitions. And, and 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 yet we can't classify the Black Lives Matter movement as a terrorist group. Um, you may be able to do that. I don't know enough about them to do them. And State Department will certainly um, classify them as a terrorist group if they are in fact a terrorist group. But abortion clinic terrorists, there's no question about it that they're terrorists. They blow things up. They assassinate abortion doctors, mm-hmm. and uh, they have mandatory sent sentencing for abortion clinic terrorism by the law yeah. and uh, it's been all carried out by Christian groups. So we have Christians that are terrorists and if you want to say um, well, so I, I, we, we, we've, we've got to take we've people. got to take a break here we'll be back in a few seconds. Exonation. Nation Dr. Ann Speckard is our special guest and speckard.com uh, and www.icsv.org We'll be back after this break. Don't go away. As host of Dialogue with Divinity, I am thrilled to join the Exxon Broadcast Network and their growing number of affiliates. My quest for a connection to the divine ignited my successful career path as an international spiritual counselor for over 40 years, an author of four books, and well-known metaphysical educator. My clients call me their spiritual mama. So my job is to offer you a radio show to help you grow spiritually with wisdom and get specific tools from guests who are experts in their field. Tune in to Dialogue with Divinity and be part of the conversation with Spirit. My goal, your happy soul. For more information, please visit my website at johannacarroll.com. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the Exome Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, High Tech with Corey Kay, and every minute of the 24-7, 365 programming of the Exome Broadcast Network by calling 712-432-9459, courtesy of TalkStream Live. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 712-432-9459 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember, 712-432-9459 for the best of paranormal, new age, thought-provoking, sci-fi radio programming 24-7, 365. Coming soon to the Exxon Broadcast Network is a different perspective with me, Kevin Randall, as your host. We'll be taking a close look at what is happening in the world of UFOs today with side trips into the paranormal. 
guests will range from those who are household names to those who have a different perspective on a variety of topics. No topic will be taboo, but there will be tough questions asked as we all search for the truth about UFOs, the paranormal, and those things that excite us. Sometimes we'll agree with a guest and sometimes we won't, but we'll try to keep the program topical. For those of you who like to read, be sure to visit www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com and remember to listen to the other fine programs on the X-Zone Broadcast Network at www.xzbn.net. This is Kevin Randall. For nearly 30 years, I have been investigating the case of the Roswell UFO. I have interviewed hundreds of people and stood on the crash site. Now in Roswell in the 21st century, I have reviewed dozens of hours of audio and videotaped interviews, examined hundreds of files that relate to the crash, and have returned to Roswell in an attempt to put all that information into the proper perspective. For the first time in Roswell in the 21st century, I have made a dispassionate reevaluation of all that material and provide a new look at what happened. This is a book that clears away all the clutter that has hidden the truth for so long, strips away the various lies that surround the case, exposes the Air Force attempts at cover-up, and found a core of solid information that tells us all where the case stands today. Roswell in the 21st Century will be available in just a few weeks. For more information, please visit my website at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. What Happened in Benghazi is revealed by Nicholas Genix, author of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. He informs the American people that President Obama deceived them by advocating a strong foreign policy prior to the 2012 presidential election, and Hillary Clinton supported this deception. As the title infers, there is a connection between Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. Ample evidence informs Americans that Obama's early indoctrination in the Quran developed an infinity for Islam, why the Quran is the source of discontent in many countries, and why the Obama foreign policy deception led to poor military action and caused the loss of American lives in Benghazi. Genix provides 36 questions for the Select Committee on Benghazi to validate if Americans are justified to mistrust President Obama and Hillary Clinton. An overview of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi is presented on the website www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. Afterlife expert Roberta Grimes was the first one to say that dying can be fun. Now her best-selling book, The Fun of Dying, is available in stores worldwide. So if you wonder whether death ends life, how it feels to die, or what heaven might be like, The Fun of Dying was written for you. And if you have always been afraid of death, or if you worry that your life has no meaning, let The Fun of Dying ease your fears and bring new meaning to your life. Nothing said in The Fun of Dying is based on the teachings of any religion. Instead, Roberta draws on evidence to explain how death happens, how it feels, and what comes next. A lot of the best death-related evidence was produced in the first half of the 20th century. When it is put together with recent discoveries, it tells a consistent and amazing story. Roberta Grimes blogs and answers questions at robertagrimes.com. Her wonderful book, The Fun of Dying, is available on Amazon and at stores worldwide wherever books are sold. Explanation, Dr. Ann Speckard is our special guest, www.annspeckard.com and www.icsve.org. Before we went to the uh, break, uh, doctor, we were talking about how one expert says, it, you know, trying to mix all these different cultures and all these different religions is basically doing something that members of the animal kingdom and, uh, and other species on this planet of ours realize cannot be done how can we then successfully believe that if we are part of the animal kingdom that we can do what mother nature has been unable to do since the beginning of time you sound like you're right out of the hitler youth or the nazi movement um no ma'am i'm just know, i'm just tired of canadians and americans not being able to get the proper care that they need because their government is too 
focused on bringing in immigrants because the government is going after the immigrant vote. That's what I'm straight out of. Okay, but you're talking about the animal kingdom and mixing uh, yeah. uh, species. I mean, who's the who's the non-humans here? Immigrants? Muslims? Go on. I'm listening. Well, the same things were said about the Jews during the Holocaust, that they were vermin. And uh, that's a terrible thing to say about any class of human being. If you want to talk about terrorists and say we don't want to let terrorists into our country and we should be extremely careful, you can go as far as you wish mm -hmm. um, to say these are the limits of how I would be careful. I would not allow one single immigrant into this country because I fear terrorists. I happen to disagree with you. Um, I know plenty of immigrants that are Muslims that are doing great work. My mm -hmm. partner's one of them. Uh, Ahmet Yala, he's from Turkey, he's Muslim, and he's fighting ISIS daily. And yet, we're, ISIS is winning, we're losing. Well, is that because he's a vermin? No, I mean, that's because they, it seems that the forces who are def trying to defeat ISIS just are missing something. What are, what are they missing? You know, it's nice to talk about the psychology of the, of the immigrants, and I'll agree with you. There is good and bad in every group, in every group. So let's, let's take a look where I believe the microscope should go, and that's on the military. That's on the government. That's on organizations like NATO. How come these people, these organizations, aren't doing what many perceive to be not enough? How come the United States hasn't put boots on the ground? Wouldn't that be the logical thing to do? It might be, but um, boots on the ground, the last time we did it in Iraq, cost billions of dollars, mm -hmm. didn't have a good result, and um, uh, there's a lot of exhaustion in the U.S. for spending more money because people want their own roads, their own schools, their own hospitals, their own shopping malls to be uh, uh, built up, and they want taxpayer dollars spent on their own country. So most Americans are not real enthusiastic about spending a whole gob of money to go over to Syria, especially when we can't find a good partner. And uh, we were arming people, and then we found out some of our arms were going into the very group <laughs> that we're trying to fight. So if there's not a good partner, uh, it might not be a good idea. Yeah, if there's not an, a lot of enthusiasm for boots on the ground, um, probably you're going to get voted out of office as soon as uh, possible. So it's all politically, you know, it's politically motivated. It might cost it might cost the government some money. Jeez, imagine that. And and yet, you know, there's not enough money for the homeless. There's not enough money for the hungry. There's not enough money for the unemployed. There's not enough money for the veterans who go over there and give so much, and when they come back home, get so little, and yet, refugees, they get the golden treatment. I don't understand well, now, that. Now you're mixing two things, because you asked me why we don't put boots on the ground, mm -hmm. and the veterans are a very good reason that we don't, because we now are overwhelmed with veterans. Our VA cannot keep up. Mm -hmm. We're having suicide, and we do need to take care of our veterans. Sure. And there should be money for them. So if we turn around and spend the money to go back into Syria and also don't get a good result, um, that would be a horrible pity, especially for our veterans, especially for our soldiers. And uh, immigrants, as far as I know, um, you know, get basic welfare. Um, I don't think they get any golden treatment. I would... It I was to have any authority and the powers to be, I would, like many people believe, shut the borders down until the problems are solved within the country first. Well, then if you could come and vote, you should vote for Donald Trump. I would not do that. I fully support, uh, Do I fully support Donald Trump. There's no big secret there. I fully support him. And I, you know, like, I send enough letters to our members of parliament to let them know that I am not happy. I am not happy with you know, taking care of outsiders before taking care of Canadians. And I don't know of any Canadian or any American who isn't, who doesn't share the idea well, that we need to take care of our own first. You clean up your own house before you clean up another's house. If you're talking about houses, I would agree with you. But if you're talking about people that are running away from horrible dictators, from groups that behead and rape, 
um, I would open my arms to the people that are running and help them because I believe in uh, doing humanitarian good and that it comes back to uh, bless you in the end. If you don't mm. believe that, then uh, you seem a bit selfish to me, and I'm sorry to hear it. I'm not selfish, ma'am. I'm a realist. I don't live in the world of kumbaya, let's hold hands and sing and toast marshmallows. Okay. Well, it's a real you know, world you out there. You wouldn't let me into my country either because I'm Irish. And, you know, back when my great-grandmother came, mm -hmm. you would have said dirty Irish. No, ma'am, I wouldn't. Yeah. No, ma'am, I wouldn't. No, ma'am, I wouldn't because the Irish believe in God. The Irish don't yeah. try to blow me up. What about when the Jews were running from the Holocaust? Would you have let them in? Definitely. They believe in God as well. Well, Okay, but a lot of them didn't believe in God. A lot of them were atheists. And a lot of them uh, were labeled as vermin and horrible and, uh, you know, and, and they were turned away. Well, let me ask you this then, Doctor. You just raised a, a wonderful point. When the world saw what Hitler was doing with the Holocaust, the world banded together and fought the Germans. How come the world isn't banding together? this time with the same atrocities going on in Syria. What's the big difference here? Probably because under George W. Bush, we went into a country that hadn't attacked us, and uh, it didn't turn out so well, and everybody's like, don't go back to the Middle East. Why isn't it possible to reallocate the Syrians to a part of Africa where they can be safe, taken care of, until the problems in Syria are resolved and then relocate them back to Syria. That's one solution. And, you know, uh, if you um, think it's a good one, then you should propose it. I have. I think, you know, uh, many politicians would find reasons that that wouldn't work. Um, I've never really considered it seriously, so mm -hmm. I don't have much of an answer other than that that's a possible solution. So, taking a lot of the fear factor that many non-Muslims have about Muslims. How do, how do you address that? What would you say to the people listening tonight around the world who may, who may just have that, that, that thought? I would say look at the Taurus and look at how many come from uh, other backgrounds. I mean, I just wrote a book on Shannon Connolly. She was a Catholic white girl mm -hmm. raised by professional parents and she got sucked into a terrorist group and was on her way to ISIS so you know it's it's not a guarantee that if you're a Christian or white you're never going to be a terrorist and it's not a guarantee that if you're Muslim and brown uh, you're for sure a terrorist people gravitate to things because they meet their needs and because they're seduced into it and for the most part we have not seen refugees uh, come as terrorists. We have seen refugees after a long time settling in an area falling prey to that and that worries me That if we are going to take refugees from mm -hmm. war-torn areas We need to treat them well and we need to make sure that they get psychological treatment for the traumas from the places They've run away from and who is going to pay for all this? Where does the money come from the taxpayer the American citizen who pays taxes isn't this just creating a bigger problem? If you think that your tax money should never go to help poor people that are running away from atrocities, uh, then I'm sorry, I don't mean this as an insult, but I view you as a bit selfish. I, for one, don't mind if my taxpayer dollars help some refugees. All right, then let me ask you this, doctor. You don't mind if your tax dollars help refugees, and I admire that in you. However, why not take that tax dollar money and put it in the armed forces, who, by the way, volunteered. They weren't, they weren't drafted to be members of the military. This is their job. And if they cannot do their job, they shouldn't have joined the armed forces because I guess a lot of them may have thought, well, gee, this is kind of peaceful time of, you know, in the centuries, I'm not going to get see any action. But if that is all it is, then pay, put the money where your money will best be served and that is in the military, let the military do their job, solve the problem, wouldn't that work? If you think you can kill your way out of it, but you can't kill your way out of a political problem, you have to come to political solutions. Your military can help, mm -hmm. but your military 
parade cannot. I mean, you can't kill all the terrorists. I had a congressman say that to me. We're, we're making, and I would love to tell your listeners about this because I think it's a good solution, um, one way to fight ISIS. We're interviewing actual ISIS defectors and getting them on video, putting the videos back on the internet to um, break their brand, basically. I showed it to a congressman and he said, you know, I have to tell you the truth. I think we should kill them all. When I got out okay. of the meeting, I thought, okay, where's the cutoff? Do you kill the little kids, the six-year-olds in ISIS? Do we kill them? Do we kill all the women? I mean, where is the cutoff? Do we kill the ones that are related? You know, if you're related by marriage, are you in ISIS or not in ISIS? And Doctor, I hate to do this. I've run out of time. I want to thank you so much for joining us. It's been a very good debate. And uh, Exonation. Nation, if you'd like to find out more information, www.anspeckard.com and icsve.org.